Welcome to Episode 7 of Heresy from the Haven, a Wobbly Goblin Adventures podcast coming to you from the Gamer's Haven in wonderful Spokane, Washington. We're your hosts. I'm Bob Kelly. Jay Brigitte. Steven. 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 Did you wear that color on purpose? Green? Yeah. I just wanted to blend. Mm. Am I invisible? <laughs> we'll green screen a pool like armor set on here or something. <laughs> I'm down. So in these, our intro series, we are giving you our feeble attempt to guide new players people who are deciding if Horus Heresy (laughs) is the game that they want to invest in. Uh, In past episodes, we've covered different concepts and things to keep in mind while choosing your force and building a list. Um, Please check out those past episodes if you haven't. We have finally shifted to the different forces a player may begin with. We've had two episodes on the Loyalist Legions. We've already had one episode on the Best Boys, the Traitor Legions. And this will be our final Legion episode, the rest of the, uh, the Traitor Legions. I think we're the same, wearing the same shirts in the last episode. We may have. I know, weird, right? We don't wash much. That's crazy. <laughs> or we may record more than one episode a night. We <laughs> spend all our money on models. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And thank you for that. As the owner of the Gamers Haven, thank you for that. I own own two shirts. (laughs) So we're going to be discussing a bit of theory or fluff uh, background of each of the legions, and we're just going to touch on some of the overall army rules uh, that apply to each legion and give you an idea of how the army plays. Some of those rules may not make a lot of sense to you yet if you haven't really dove into it. We're trying to kind of avoid that and just touch on some of the rules. So for saying things that don't necessarily make sense, they will make sense when we're done with this series. when we start deep diving into the game. I think a good word to describe what we're doing here, now that we've done three or four episodes of it, uh, is primers. We're giving you primers of each legion. Yeah, and something to think about, like why why you would pick your legion. Um, After this episode, the next episode, we're going to be touching on some of the non-Space Marine legions, like the Solar Auxilia, Custodes, Sisters of Silence, Militia, yeah, exactly. Um, our hope is that a new player can listen to this series and have the tools necessary to decide if Horse Heresy is the game for them and if our feeble attempt has <laughs> helped them decide on a faction whether they want to play the game or not. Um, so, I guess we can just get right on to it. Um, we're going to touch on some things like uh, Chaos and the Chaos Gods, um, how the Primarchs, the Primarch Project, how they were lost and the Legions were built uh, around them. That was in the previous episode. But you want to check out the previous episode for yeah. that one, exactly. So, I think we left off at World Eaters. We're going right into the Death Guard, and that's you. And that is me again. You guys get to hear me babble again, because Death Guard is actually, once I, I hit the stopping point that I'm satisfied with my World Eaters where they're at, Death Guard's the next Legion I'm going to dive into. Very cool. So getting right into it, the 14th Legion, the Death Guard, originally named the Dusk Raiders, were the strongest and most resilient of all the Emperor's Space Marine Legions. Real fast, ripped right off of the 40k wiki. No shame. No shame. Check it out. If you have any more questions, you want to deep diver, deep diver, deep (laughs) dive deeper into these legions, check out the, check out the, uh, the wiki. Uh, Most resilient of all the Emperor's Space Marine Legions, uh, the inheritors of Primark Mortarian, whose ge- genetic image they were created. That, they, that was terrible verbiage, Wiki. Good job. Mortarian grew to maturity on the world of Barbarus, and it was a planet that was steeped in toxic miasma, where the human population cowered in the dark lowlands, fearful of the overlords that preyed upon them from their mountaintops, mountaintop keeps deep within the fog. And again, it kind of touches on that, but it seems like the Primarchs were almost intentionally scattered to these different planets because they landed on planets that really fed into what their inherent abilities were. When the Emperor came to Barbarus, the people greeted him as their savior, yet Mortarian was jealous and resentful of the adulation heaped upon his this perfect stranger. Though his people could see that the Emperor was the Primarch's sire, he himself saw only the differences. For the stranger was noble, a noble form, again, terrible verbiage, a normal form and, t- uh, and tanned of skin, Mortarian was pale and gaunt. When Mortarian refused to join him, the Master of Mankind issued Mortarian a challenge. The Primer could defeat the last of the Overlord, the Overlords of Barbarus, Barbarus and, the, and the Emperor would depart. If he could not, 
Mortarian must accept his fate and join the Great Crusade. I'm not going to read this anymore. So, <laughs> Mortarian. I think you should do a little bit more prep next time. <laughs> I probably did. Yeah, the way it's written, I guess that's why you can like alter it yourself. Um, so, Mortarian went and, and went off on this challenge, and he went to, he, at this point, he'd pretty much taken over the human part yep. of, of Barbarus, and he was the leader of the humans, but the, the highest steeps were so poisonous, the humans could never go to it. They could never get up there. They could never. So they didn't even know who these overlords it's were, toxic, what they were. Toxic there's there's in the Death Guard theories. There's uh, maybe they were some kind of alien race. There was something that could, that could handle this this massive toxicity in the upper atmosphere. So he goes up there. He goes to fight the last overlord, and he loses. And as he's losing, the emperor actually appears and can breathe, can be fine, because even Mortarian is being overtaken by this this poison, and beheads this guy and says, now you're joining me. So he's put in front of his, he, had, uh, he was put in front of his, his legion and he took over his legion and saw that they were made his same kind and, and the Death Guard. He immediately renamed them the Death Guard uh, from the, uh, what were they, the Dusk Raiders. So when it came down to Horus coming and saying, do you want to join against the Emperor? He already had that kind of built in hatred and jealousy of the Emperor. So again, almost like, you know, you could almost make it akin to the seven deadly sins. Like he was, he was already ready to leave. And I think yeah. Horus intentionally went, picked the Primarchs first that he had since hated the Emperor already. And they were the ones that were like, yep, we got you. We're going to join you. So the Siege of Terra was kind of the final battle of the Horus Heresy. And on their way to the Siege of Terra, the Death Guard fleet became becalmed in the warp. They're traveling through the warp. And their whole fleet was assailed with this toxic storm of all these, uh, what they call it here, um, plagues so virulent, not even their legendary resist, uh, resilience could withstand them. And the entire legion on ship, becalmed in the warp, all became violently sick, started bloating, started like pustules, like it was already starting, and, and Mortarian himself there's a lot of speculation about this too, but he, whether it was by design or not, but he basically called out and said, just somebody save us. And Nurgle shows up. So Nurgle being one of the four chaos gods, Nurgle is the, essentially the opposite of Zinch, where Zinch is about change. Nurgle is about no change, stagnant, stale. And when all of a sudden the Death Guards show up to siege Terra and their soldiers start pouring out, and even the other traitor legions are like, what, what the hell that? just happened is these guys come out and they're cloud of flies, rot, decay, you know, their guts are hanging out. They're uh, aesthetically they're they're a very cool army, but they're they're pretty gross. They're nasty. Yeah, they're pretty gross. Nasty. Um, nasty. Their once gleaming white and gray armor was stained with filth, and the noble warriors were transformed into walking hives of death and abomination. We're still the plague marines of the Death Guard, were now hosts of the most virulent afflictions. Uh, that their new patron, the plague god Nurgle, could concoct. Condemned to a deathless state of eternal decay, the Death Guard would spread their pestilent diseases, the length and breadth of the galaxy, for the greater glory of chaos. So, your Death Guard. Uh, their army-wide special rule, pretty solid. It is, uh, with some few exceptions, Death Guard have the ability to move and fire weapons as if they hadn't moved. So, so good. there's a there's a rule in the game that there's different weapon classifications that moving and firing gives you limitations to how well you fire that weapon. Death Guard don't have that. They can move and fire heavy weapons as if they were standing still, which so is good. which is really really solid. Which leads right into their first right of war. It's called the Reaping. Their heavy support units, which would be a squad of infantry, all taking you know big heavy weapons. Uh, and their veteran unit, units can be taken as troop choices. And, and when we went over the, the force organization chart, you have more options for troop choices than you do any of the other. So if you take those heavy support units as troop choices, now you've got a ton of heavy Nobody weapon squads walking it. around. Not necessarily. They're still you're not your compulsory ones, the ones you have to take. But you can take a lot more heavy weapons. But that frees up your heavy support choices for your tanks, which may really? not have been the greatest. I don't know if this is what they planned in design. But there's limitations to how yep. far a tank can move and fire its heavy weapons. With a Death Guard, their tanks can move full distance and fire all their heavy weapons without hindrance, which is pretty ding dang good, honestly. It's, yes. it's pretty solid. Um, so you have an army now that's amazing at moving and firing very powerful heavy weapons. Uh, but the cost is the army can never run, 
which is a mechanic in the game where if you choose not to shoot, you can move extra, which my world leaders do a lot because they can they can move and run. Um, and I think when we talked about in uh, the Loyalist Legions, the Space Wolves have an ability where they can move and run. Normally you can't charge. Space Wolves can charge. Death Guard can't run at all. So they're very slow, purposeful, moving across the table, firing these but heavy weapons. But they are weapons. inevitable. Yeah, they are inevitable. They're slow, but where other armies have to kind of pick and shoot if they're going to move and shoot, or go, we're just like, oh, we're nope, moving shoot. I can't. You, you move behind that cover, I'm going to move over here and still fire so and shoot without slow. any negatives, right? <laughs> Um, so that right of war, uh, let's get back to it here. If I can find it. Uh, oh, you also can't use any other form of deployment. So there's other forms of deployment, whether you teleport out of the table or Jay had mentioned out flanking in the last episode, Death Guard can't use any abilities that allow them any other ways. You, you deploy, if you use that right of war. If you use that right of war, they play out, deploy on the table and they slowly grind towards yeah. you and firing heavy weapons, which Inevitable. is inevitable, which really kind of also that image of the slow creeping plague. Yeah. Kind of, oh yeah. Plays into that, sure. that. Their second right of war, which is the least popular by a lot of players of the rights of war, is called Creeping Death. Now this is the right of war I am going to use. I think with, it's pretty cool. It's, I think it's I like pretty cool, one. yeah. So what happens is your deployment zone, where you're deploying your army at the start of the game, is all considered dangerous terrain. And anytime anybody moves inside a dangerous terrain, they have to make a dice roll. If they fail it, models die. And then they take a wound. They do they take a wound. And then every uh, terrain piece on the table, area terrain, something that has a base on it, also becomes dangerous terrain. Death Guard, under this right of war, excuse me, don't have to take danger terrain tests. So now, there, it's, it's, it, with the Death Guard fluff, it's the uh, Papa Nurgle's plague. So these pieces of terrain and their deployment zone are kind of infested. Papa, Papa, Papa Nurgle, that's what he's called, <laughs> Papa Nurgle. He's, he's a joyous, joyous god. <laughs> Um, he just wants to give you a hug. He just wants to give you a big slimy hug. That's right. Uh, but that's that's a, and also while you're still in your deployment zone, uh, you actually become a little bit more resilient as well. You get a, a six plus shroud save. Um, the downside of that right of war is it is traitor only, so you cannot do a loyalist uh, right of war right. with this army, which would be kind of weird if you were doing a loyalist. Death Guard, I guess Nathaniel Garo, there's some story reasons why you would do it. But this specific right of war is traitor only, and then there's a, uh, you have to take a specific character called a Master of Siege. Um, so you're kind of limited in what HQ choices you have, because you have to take a, a Master of Siege, and you can only do this as traitors. Um, so, what would a Death Guard army look like on the table? A lot of heavy weapon uh, units, a lot of slow moving, kind of playing into that slow moving, kind of have to build into your tactics. Tanks that can actually move fast and fire all their weapons, which is kind of a weird mechanic that just came by their rules of saying that they are all um, uh, slow and purposeful, but tanks, their tanks are actually kind of fast and, and shoot the hell out of stuff. Um, and that's about it, really. I mean, you can lean into the siege side of it with that Master of Siege, gives you bonus for a lot of uh, big template weapons that you throw out. So he can he has the ability to allow you to re-roll if they scatter. Uh, so that's kind of the army I'm going into is kind of a siege warfare army of uh, of Death Guard. Yeah, and you have a bunch of artillery that puts dangerous terrain on the table. Right. Yeah, the army list I'm going to build have uh, these these specific units called rapier units that throw out uh, putting uh, graviton. I can't remember cannons. I think, but they throw out each one throw out a five inch template, and when they land on the table, the template stays, and that template becomes dangerous terrain. So now all the terrain is dangerous, yep. my deployment zone is dangerous, and then all of these things I throw out onto the table are dangerous. So the my army design for this army, and we're going to go into it uh, later episode, I'm going to do episodes on how I build them, how I paint them, and then how their army plays. It's going to play a very specific way, come at me, but you're going to take a lot of damage as you're coming at me. Absolutely. And that should be pretty I think fun. It's, a, it's a really cool legion that really plays into the terrain aspect of the game, mm -hmm. which isn't common at all. No, not, but not attack from a new angle is pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And the terrain doesn't affect me. Yeah, exactly. it affects you. It doesn't yeah. affect me. So that's that's pretty fun. But it's pretty much it for Death Guard. Big, pimply, rotten, maggoty bad guys that can move and fire heavy weapons. Not too hard to understand. For good guys. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what do we got up next? Oh, I think we're me. The Thousand Suns. <sighs> Fourteen, fifteen. That's how it works. Yeah, numbers. Fourteenth yep. uh, so was the Ultramarines. Yep. No, fourteenth is the Death Guard. Or oh, fourteenth Death Guard, right? You're you just did. That's right. Uh, we're all caught up. We're all caught up. In case you were wondering, we're on Thousand Suns, which is 15. 
Um, so the Thousand Suns, they were the 15th Legion, as we've stated, uh, of the 20 of the Space Marine of the 20 original Space Marine units. Uh, legions, excuse me. Uh, their pride mark is Magnus, often called Magnus the Red. Um, he was the fun fact tallest Primark by far. Uh, and he had one eye. Well, he wasn't born with one eye. He got that. He um, got that. <laughs> so they were named the Thousand Sons by the Emperor them, himself uh, when he made exactly one thousand of them. Uh, another get, go figure. Um, and then he sent them out into uh, the galaxy as part of a great crusade. Five years into that crusade, uh, they all began to spontaneously develop psychic abilities, which are, are interesting. Um, the development, however, was also followed by a wave of horrific, unwilling, degenerative mutations. So they were praising themselves. Yes. They're like, oh, this is awesome. We all have the, we all share this. They were, we were chosen for a reason. Oh, crap. Um, <laughs> so, um, so this mutative process became referred to as the flesh change and was feared by the thousand sons, uh, forcing their numbers to dwindle as they were continuously, it got to the point where they were putting people, uh, their, their fellow legionnaires into stasis in order to prevent the change from happening. And they were dwindling day, day in and day out. Um, when Magnus was discovered, during the Great Crusade on the home world, his home world of Prospero, uh, he was able to actually stop this change from happening. Mm -hmm. And in the discovery of whatever he did, because he is, other, bar none other than the Emperor himself, he's the strongest in psychic abilities, um, he did something to stop that change, and whatever that did caused him to lose an eye. Ah, interesting. So uh, that's why he is now known as the Cyclops. Cyclops. Primark. Interesting. Um, now the Legion flourished after finding their Primarch, and this is a thing. It's a series that rep repeats itself over and over in the Thousand Suns history. They made made a thousand of them. They make more. They go back to a thousand. They make more. Things happen. They go back to a thousand. Uh, it's kind of perpetual. We kind of stay at a thousand. Um, but after they found the Primark, they flourished, their numbers grew. Uh, I think uh, right around uh, the start of the heresy, they numbered about 80,000, which is a smaller, in the smaller mm -hmm. realm of yep. uh, legions. So they employed the most powerful psychers in any of the legions, which makes sense because when the emperor was implanting the gene seed, he was finding people who were from an area where there was a lot of psychic sensitive people. Um, mm -hmm. And Prospero, the world that he landed on, is also very, very psychically oriented. Predetermined. Uh, predetermined. Right. Uh, we've been talking about that. Um, as far as the tactics went, this is something I found interesting. Their uh, most awfully used tactic was diplomatic guile and trickery mm -hmm. to bring about compliance. So weird that you're attracted to them. I, you know, this is my this is my new pet project. And I've uh, <laughs> I've heard on so many sources from so many sources that the Thousand Suns are the weakest or the worst Legion, and well, after going for in gameplay, the, for gameplay, um, not at all. that is not, not the case. Nope. I would argue they're probably on the opposite end of that spectrum. They're just complex. They're very they're complex. complex. Yep. Um, so I keep saying um a lot, and that's new. I don't like that. Diplomatic dial and trickery. <clears throat> Let's see, where was I? This made all of the other Primarchs very nervous. And some of them even went so far as they didn't want psychers in the legions whatsoever. So enough of them got together and caused a, a big ruckus, and they had what is called the Council of Nicaea where the yeah, emperor sat down, and it's a huge deal. Uh, the emperor sat down with his sons, and they decided that he, his official edict was to ban all psychic use by all the legions. Now, is that because psychic power is basically or, or tapping into that warp we talked about, that chaos energy? Is that kind of how it works? Well, see, at that point, nobody knew there was a chaos right. energy other than maybe the Emperor because so he was kind of putting into psychers it. into the Legion and Magnus ended up on a psychic planet. Yes. Yep. Things start to tie so, together. Yep. You start to tie things together. 
So essentially, because the Emperor banned all psychic use in the legions, not all legions complied, obviously, but Magnus, being the good son that he was, took his legion and retired to Prospero. They kind of retired from the Great Crusade. Um, and set up shop at home because they were basically all psychers. And you take away their greatest weapon. You take away their greatest weapon and, and the things practice. that yep. and they didn't view it as anything. They viewed it as progress. It was right. science to them, not anything else. Uh, so they view, view themselves as scholars. So they go, they retreat back to Prospero, and the rest of the story is incredibly tragic. Magnus did nothing wrong. Magnus did arguably nothing wrong. A true loyalist. But I know we've spoiled a lot of things. This is one thing I don't think I want to spoil. I think we could probably spoil it if we did the deep dive. Yes, that way absolutely. If people want to find out themselves, don't look at the deep dive when we do Thousand Sons. But when, when Bob said that the World Eaters was probably the most tragic of the stories. It is. This is. Up there. It's up there with the, with the tragicness of Primarchs. It's up there. Most people think that Magnus' story, The Thousand Sons, is the is the most tragic. Yeah, it's it's argue it, it, it's arguably so. And I'm not F gonna F the Space Wolves. Yes. F the Space Wolves. Don't even care if you like Space Wolves. F the Space so, Wolves. <laughs> Third Good Legion if you want to play and play. Uh, so <laughs> no. I'm not gonna go much further into that. I'll we'll say that yes, they do turn to chaos. Zeech specifically. Zeech specifically, the, the yeah. god of change. Fourth chaos um, god. Yeah. So, that's the that's the thousand suns. You guys got any Egyptian mythology? Oh yeah, yeah. Just think of that. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful white, beautiful pyramids. legion. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they definitely dove into that Egyptian mythology. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, so legion ability is called the Colt Arcana, and all infantry units and all cavalry units that they gain the Psyker subtype, and characters gain one of five minor Colt Arcanas that the Maybe interject. The only way normally you can get a Psyker is... Well, the, we're not there yet. Okay. These are minor abilities that are specific to Thousand Suns. So they have these dumbed-down versions, essentially, of the Psychic Disciplines that each unit, excuse me, character can take. Independent characters can gain a Psychic Discipline for 15 points. This is the part you're talking about. <laughs> normally, you have to take a console which is an HQ choice, and that console has to be taken as a librarian. That's the way they get a psychic discipline. The only way to have psychers is take a century and make it a console, make a librarian, right? So with this, independent characters can gain a psychic discipline from the normal chart for 15 points, which means you're not going to understand some of this probably, but you can take one of those centurions as an HQ choice Give them a normal console upgrade, such as Master of Signals, uh, Chaplain, uh, Master of Siege, Master of Siege, yeah. any of these things, and then you can put for fifteen points. Give them a, a psychic ability to make them a librarian make as well. A librarian as well. That's really cool. Your um, entire army of psychers. Right? Your entire army is essentially psychers. Uh, that's awesome. It is. Psychic abilities are a thing in the game. That by the, the fact that most armies only have maybe one or two psychers, there some of these disciplines that you can choose are very very powerful. Absolutely, space and wizards. You, you, the space space wizards. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you can just spread them through the whole army. So, they have two rights of war. One right of war is called the Archaean configuration. Um, I alluded to this already. Due to the lack of numbers of the Thousand Suns, they used automata uh, to bolster their ranks. So essentially, robots. they had big robots that mm -hmm. marched around that are kind of looked like arcane contemptors, uh, contemptor dreadnoughts, and they were infused with psychic energies and used in battle prior to uh, Magnus's return because the they wanted to stay in the fight, the Thousand Suns, and be part of the Great Crusade, but they kept having to put people in stasis and things. Um, because tentacles. What's cool about it is the psychic abilities. You have you suffer perils of the warp when you when you try and use abilities sometimes, and you a psyker tries to manifest something, and you roll dice, and either it succeeds or it perils of the warp, and you take damage. If you're close enough to one of these robots, 
the, the robot can take the damage instead of you. Oh, that's cool. Which yeah, is really safer. Yeah. You can you can sure shut course. it off uh, in that way, and that's one of that's one of their main kind of fluffy things. Uh, they pissed off the Mechanicum with their use of these robots because the Mechanicum don't like arcane infused robots. Science only, right? Science only, but as the Thousand Suns thought this was science, hey, more power to them. Uh, the other right of war, I actually plan on building both of these armies because I'm one of those collect everything and do everything. Uh, the card <laughs> of the Crimson King is the other right of war. Someone's got to pay for your kids' uh, college. Right? <laughs> yes. So when Magnus would take to the field, he would bring along his elite, and he would bring along all of the psychic potential that he could in order to devastatingly destroy his enemies. He was sent to fight these obscure alien races, alien like forms or these warlords that just nobody really understood and things like that. And so he would bring his most elite with him. That's reflected in the Crimson King uh, right of war where <clears throat> the segment terminators which are really cool. I'll get to it in a second. I'm just going to say something. Uh, I'll, I'll just throw it out there. Uh, their character sergeants are also can be upgraded to be librarians. And in this Rite of War, you can take Terminators as troop choices instead of elite choices. So Lots of Terminators, a lot of elite warriors. A lot more Terminators, yeah. all the wizards. And more space wizards. Uh, and also, it allows you to Deep strike up to six infantry units. And deep striking is a way to it's go onto you, the table and you just teleport onto the table instead and they, of starting your They class. teleport. They, they basically yeah. use the warp to teleport them on to, uh, into the battlefield. pretty good. Pretty strong strategy. Yep. Yep. Oh, did I mention they also gain fear one when they enter? Oh, no. That's good. So now they're so, reducing anybody, any enemy units close to them, their leadership, so they can potentially run away easier. Yep. Correct. So you're... Teleporting in space wizards in Terminator armor and giving them fear. That's pretty good. Just but apparently, good. Thousand Suns are one of the worst. Some people say that. So we, we've, we've heard that, sure. Uh, I don't agree. I don't agree. <laughs> I just think what it comes down to, I mentioned earlier, is it's a super complex army. Mm -hmm. So if you are thinking of playing Thousand Suns, every unit is going to have their own rule to kind of keep track of. Sure. Yes. Don't want to you know, make you scared of playing them, but it, that also maybe a plus for you. You kind of build a puzzle where you're building your army. Yeah, it's like a Swiss army. Yeah. You've got to get a lot of tools in the toolbox. If down. you're like me, and complex things are what you're attracted to, this is a great army choice. Yeah, right. if you, beautiful if you on like, the table, sure. I mean, they're beautiful reds and golds, uh, Egyptian motif. They have the cool... Kopesh swords and things like that. They're a beautiful army to look at, and if you like complexity, they're right up your alley. A really cool traitor legion that didn't necessarily want to go traitor. Right, but that's in the part we don't talk about. Yeah, I mean, they did, you know, choose to do psychics. They embraced it later. They embraced the war. Yeah. They embraced science. The war. Science. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that brings us to. Hey! Sons of Horus. I've heard that word before, Horus. Horus? Who's Horus? The what Horus is, what heresy. is this game called again? Right. <laughs> the 16th Legion, the Sons of Horus. This is this is going to be a, a tough summary because we could spend three hours explaining the How? fluff and the narrative storyline that really kicked off this whole thing. He's the Emperor's favorite. So the 16th strongest. Legion, the Sons of Horus, a.k.a. the Luna Wolves. Led by the War Master himself, Horus Lupercal. Now, what's a War Master, you ask? Thank you for asking. <laughs> what's a War Master, Jay? The Great Crusades the Emperor was on, getting all of his Primarch sons, uh, establishing the legions. Eventually, he was like, you know what? I got stuff to do back on Terra. I need to pick one of my Primarch sons to be my War Master. Who's going to lead this crusade in my stead? And he chose Horus of the Sons of Horus. At the time, the Luna Wolves, they were called. Once he became the War Master, the Emperor said, hey, rename your legion called the Sons of Horus. There was a couple other options out there to choose. I think Robo Dorn, maybe Robo Dorn. The Lion. The Lion were other choices. 
By the end, Horus was chosen as the Horus Warmaster. was the greatest tactician, the greatest fighter, the greatest solid. He, he was, was the, the first Primarch to be found. The favorite mm -hmm. son. The first to be found? Well, of course. I think there was one already there. It's according to Might come later. Uh, Horus was a great diplomat. He, he just kind of knew how to talk to his brothers, get them to work together. He, he probably was the best choice for a Warmaster, mm -hmm. honestly. I'm going to really quickly stop here and just let's say again, the entire story, entire setting of the Horus Heresy, uh, the game we are playing, centers on Horus and his legion. Um, we highly recommend <laughs> that book series, the Horus Heresy. Yeah. <laughs> At least books one through four, that it's going to dive into so much more that I can kind of cover here. Mm -hmm. but I just want to point that out again. Please go read that. Uh, Horus did fall to chaos, but also kind of tragic and it was kind of chosen for him. Thrust upon him? Thrust upon him by the, the true worst legion, the word bearers. We're going to get to here in a little bit. Um, everybody hates the word bearers. They're the bad guys. They're the true bad guys. Um, Horus was, I believe, stabbed with a, a demonic influence dagger at some point. Um, fell to chaos. How did that guy get that dagger? I... Word bearers. Word bearers. We'll get to <laughs> So eventually, Horus falls to chaos, and he, through his great tactical mind, his great diplomatic ability, he kind of starts moving pieces around the game board. He, he sends some of the more loyal legions off to far reaches of the universe and the galaxies. He, he kind of pokes the certain Primarchs he know are going to go against the Emperor himself. Yeah. He really planned all of this beforehand. And being the War Master, he had that ability to tell the other Primarchs, you, you you're going to go do this, you're going to go do this. When you're in charge, he really... Yeah. It's kind of amazing he lost, because he, he had a really big jump um, on this whole shebang when it first started. Um, a great all-around Legion. The Sons of Horus really excel in anything you want them to do. You don't have to really shoehorn yourself into any way you want to play the Legion. Um, Horus, at a large... Obviously, a legion because he's in charge, so you can kind of pick and choose what you want to play. Um, it kind of goes into their army-wide special rule, where they're, they're just kind of a, a tougher legion. And when you get into the close combat phase, um, whether you charge or you are charged by your, your opponent, um, they're at minus one strength against you. So it's harder for them to wound. Yeah, you. it's harder for them to, to really hurt you. It just kind of plays into the Sons of Horus being um, this elite legion that doesn't really. They're not, they're not bad at anything. It's kind of a, kind of a generic rule. Um, it's not super narrative. I'm kind of disappointed as I was reading it. The Sons of Horus, because they're, they're not, generic's not the right word. They're kind of all-rounders. So maybe it is kind of hard to tie something into the fluff for the Sons of Horus. Um, but their characters of the army are super cool. Horus himself is arguably strongest character in the game. Abaddon. There's a, lot of, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of Black Legion right behind us. So, again, I think Bob's another good, good source. That's 40K. Leave it behind us. Abaddon's behind us. <laughs> Abaddon's standing right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty cool um, armory. They have things like um, upgraded power axes, upgraded bolters, kind of signifying that they have the best equipment, the more kind of the higher technology coming up time. As the War Master, you're privy to those things, mm -hmm. right? Now, their rights of wars, they're pretty cool. The first one's called the Black Reaving. This plays into the Sons of Horus in kind of the later stages of the heresy. Let me back up. It's not spoilers, but Hors Her uh, Horus dies, right? We can, we can say that. It is now. I mean, it's it's cats out of the bag. It, it probably was a spoiler. Yeah. But, I mean, not really. I mean, 40K, the Space Marines. Like, the Siege of Terra. Right. Horus yeah. is not with us in 40 The Siege of Terror, the, the Emperor finally <laughs> says, you know what, I'm going to end this after Horus kills a certain winged Primarch. <laughs> <laughs> he fights the Emperor one-on-one. -on -one. Mortally wounded. Mortally wounded the Emperor, to be fair. Well, uh, Horus was already wounded. Yes. That's why he lost. That's why he lost. <laughs> well, at that time, he was kind of supercharged by chaos. Sure. And, and yeah. Horus ascended, yeah. Yeah, Horus didn't follow a certain fact. He was kind of the, the all chaos together. Just He was empowered by the gods themselves as their champion. That takes to the Black Reaving. So the Black Reaving uh, really plays into when the Sons of Horus became more of a, uh, a vicious and predatorial in their tactics. It lets you take special units called Reavers as line troops. 
uh, think of an upgraded uh, close combat squad. Yeah, they're elite forces. Yeah, right? they're elite forces. Really what it allows you to do is whenever one of your units charges into a unit who's already in combat, or if two units of yours charge at the same time, um, they're getting bonuses on the charge, extra attacks. Mm -hmm. So kind of those pack tactics, kind of crushing the enemy under their um, forces. Uh, the next one's called the Long March. Now this is actually a traitor only. So this is definitely after a uh, horse turns. Uh, all of your infantry and dreadnoughts, kind of the bigger bigger guys right here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not Lork himself, but the ones like him, get plus one movement. It also lets you, yeah, the whole infantry dreadnoughts army wide, plus one movement. It's going across the board. And then you take your Terminators as troop choices, not line. So they can't score. We mentioned line before. But it kind of opens up more elite slots. Sure. Like we've talked about. Let's all of them outflank. Okay. So again, it, we've seen rights of war kind of similar to this, but what you see is the, the infantry dreadnoughts moving faster across the board as you're outflanking. Kind of plays into superior tactics. Mm. Yeah, we've seen from other legions. Again, the Sons of Horus, I missed a whole lot for you guys. There's so much out there about them. The books are literally about them in the series. Read all about them. But if you want to play the legion that kicked off the whole thing and the whole... Horse hair self is centered on, pick the sons of horse. It's almost a legion that's so vast you can't really well, sum it up. One of the things that it, it seems pretty relevant is the fact that Horus was chosen as the war master. And as you're talking about their different abilities and their different rights of wars, it's like, oh, well that's the White Scar's ability. Yep. Oh wait, that's the this unit's this this legion's ability. That's just, that's what Horus was. He was the greatest of all of them. He had all of the abilities. He was the the the, the, the packed hacks are like space wolves. Absolutely. And, yeah. yeah. You have you have a lot of the different legions. So probably as far as the traitor legion goes, one of the most flexible. Yep. It, pretty much any way you want to build your army, you're building a sense of Horus army. Which is super cool. tough character. Some of the best characters in the game. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's also interesting to mention in, in actual gameplay. So you can take, we've talked about how you can take a Primarch as your leader. Uh, there's actually two Horus Primarchs. You can take yes. Horus as the Primarch, and then uh, Forge World also released uh, the, the Horus Ascended. Horus Ascended. And he is a tank. And you were right in saying, like, all the Chaos Gods wanted Horus. Like, come to Nurgle, come yep. to Zinch, come to Slaanesh. And, and he's like, nope. And they all favored him. So that's why he has kind of all their little bit of abilities and nude upon him and his, his forces. He's also the highest point cost. Yeah, Primark on Primark, Horus doesn't lose. No one's beating Horus. No one beats Horus. It doesn't matter. There's a couple that come close. Yeah, Lion's close, but it's one on one. Horus is the guy, and that's regular Horus. That's not Horus. That's not even Horus right? Yeah, yeah. So that will bring us to the worst Legion. I don't mean that the baddest Legion. Well, again, spurned the word bears. The word bears. To be so, fair, I don't know that much about. Them. Wordbearers actually have it's it's they're they're a pretty interesting <clears throat> engine. I know a lot about them. I'll I'll do the word. There's some cool stuff there. So we can we'll talk we'll uh, we'll we'll come back to uh, uh, wiki here. So originally known as the Imperial Heralds by the Emperor or the Iconoclast by their fellow Legionnaires. Like no, they they were actually named two different names. Uh, the Wordbearers are the 14th Legion of the first founding of Space Marines. 17th. That too. 17th Legion. I copied and pasted this shit. It's wrong. Somebody messed with All you. right. <laughs> 17th <laughs> Legion. Wait, is Wikipedia not reliable? <laughs> 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 so anything we're telling you is actually a lie. It's, it's all <laughs> Alpha Legion wrote it all. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, through their actions, they were the ones that corrupted the War Master Horus and brought on the terrible galactic civil war of the Horus Heresy and all of its savagery. Uh, after the... Legion was reunited with its lost Primarch. He renamed uh, Lorgar. Uh, he renamed the 17th Legion the Word Bears, which is in line with his belief that the Emperor of Mankind was actually a divine savior of humanity. I think it's important to say, I'm not going to read this. The, uh, the, at that point, when the Emperor, the first thing he did was kind of cleanse Terra and take Terra over mm -hmm. before he started the Primarch project, one of the first things he did is abolish all religion. And he refused in any of the Imperium to allow religion to become a thing. There was no worshipping, there was no nothing. That was an actual decree. That was an actual, yeah. absolutely. There's, well, we've talked about the 2nd and the 11th. We still don't know what happened to them, but something happened to them 
that they were wiped out. There's speculation this might have been part of it. Well, Lorgar, the planet that he landed on, was a very zealot, religious-based planet. So his, when he found his legion, was given his legion, and he saw the emperor of mankind, he actually secretly started worshiping the emperor yeah. as a god, and his legion started worshiping as a god. And he, had, he created a planet that was uh, essentially the most beautiful planet in all of the Imperium, and it was all shrines and churches dedicated to worshiping the emperor. So when the emperor found out, he came down with a heavy wrath, and the dark or the the, uh, the word bearers almost went the way of the second and the eleventh, and they were barely pulled out of it. Erebus, if there's a bad guy, ah, Erebus. Erebus is the uh, the grand chaplain religious figure of the word bearers, and Erebus basically nudged Lorgar into saying, "Well, if the emperor wasn't worth your worship, your dedication, check out these chaos gods I found." Yeah. He, he just found them. I just found these, pocket. yeah. And, and he, went, he did. He right, checked them out. He checked them <laughs> out right out of his pocket. It was Chaos Gods. And the, where the uh, Lorgar had written a book called uh, The Book of the Emperor, he actually rewrote the book as the Book of Lorgar and started worshiping the Chaos Gods. So this happened before Horus had heard of the Chaos Gods, anybody had heard of the Chaos Gods, other than maybe the Emperor. A lot of speculation. The Emperor yeah. knew all about it ahead of time when he was doing this. Um, and then Lorgar starts worshiping the Chaos God. So Erebus is the one who eventually got to Horus, and it was all about this influence, nudging, using religion to nudge people into different directions. And a specific blade. Uh, right, well, spoiler alert. Right? Um, so the word bearers are the scions of the Primarch Lorgar, the Dark Apostle of Chaos, and the first of the Primarchs to be corrupted by the ruinous powers of Chaos. Word bearers sought a uh, sought of being worthy of their veneration. That's a bit. Of, uh, that's not even a sentence. Uh, <laughs> but when the emperor denounced such practices during the Great Crusade, the, the banning of religion, they turned to the war from the powers of chaos within. Through their actions, they corrupted the warmaster Horus and brought on his terrible galactic civil war. I think I read that already, didn't I? Uh, so these are the guys that literally caused the whole Horus heresy. Um, they are uh, they're, they're essentially fallen paladins. They're religious zealots. Uh, Iconography-wise, I think the army is a very cool-looking army. They're, they're a deep red, a lot of ruins uh, carved in their armor. Scriptures. A lot of scripture. Yeah. Uh, they were called oaths of the moment. In 40K, yeah. people would know them as purity seals, but without the wax, they were, uh, they were oaths that warriors would take before they went into the battle, the oaths of the moment. So they're covered in scripture. Their tanks are covered in scripture. Lorgar himself ended up, uh, when the Horus Heresy kicked in, uh, before he showed up at the Battle of Kelf and confronted um, uh, girly men, he had his entire head and face tattooed in, in all sorts of scripture and whatnot. So really your your evil paladins, if you will. Um, uh, did they wise. actually introduce kind of the the demons and demonic? Absolutely. Before so the first Art even did. Yeah, before, yeah, yeah. So that's a tragic story. So I had mentioned earlier in the last episode that I'd love to bring uh, an allied contingent of uh, word bearers to my world leaders, but my right of war I'm running currently doesn't allow allies, but... Uh, Karn had a bestie. Karn, who's basically running the world leaders, had a bestie in uh, Argotal. And Argotal and his company, the Galver Back, were one of the most ferocious fighters of the uh, of the word bearers. And Lorgar just sent him into the war. Hey, you guys should go check out the war. Yeah. And no big deal. in in, in the fine. future of the Warhammer world, to travel through the warp, they created these things called Geller Fields that would not allow demons to come out of their ships. Well, there were no Geller Fields. They're literally the first of humanity to ever go into the warp. And the entire that we know company, well, valid, uh, the entire company got possessed by demons. Yep. And what's interesting about them uh, is they're, they're, for lack of better comparisons, kind of like the Hulk. Like they walk around in normal marine armor. Yeah. But and there's, there's like two souls in one body. There's a yep. demon and a former marine. And the demon's in his ear going, let me out, let me out, let me go, let me go. And the marine's like, no, I got this. And then when it's time to go, literally their armor would crack, split open, and they'd turn into these big kind of demon yep. marine things. And the first time all the other marine chapters saw this, they're just like, well, what, what just happened, that? right? But that's that's what happened to Argo Tall's company when they came back out of the warp, is they were possessed by demons. And it was done intentionally. So Lorgar, again, and Erebus. So if you like bad, bad guys, these guys might be the guys. Um, so leaning into... 
uh, their their rules, their army wide special rules called True Believers, um, and they basically gain the bonus to a leadership. Uh, they gain bonuses to their leadership, well, not bonuses. They're reduced negatives to their leaderships. They can't be reduced right. below a certain level. So you, again, your leadership value is something when something terrible happens, scary happens, something, and you want to hit the deck, you want to run away. They can't be reduced very much. It's hard so to break their faith. It's hard to break their faith. That's exactly it. It's it's, it's because of their faith. Um, it's not a real powerful. Some of the other legions have a lot stronger right of wars, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, army wide rules, but their right of wars pretty solid. Uh, their first right of war, in my opinion, probably one of the best in in the game itself. It's called the Dark Brethren. And when a, a word bearer player, it, before the game starts, he picks an enemy unit that's either on the table, if they have nothing on the table, that it's one. off the yeah. table. Yeah, it's that one. That one. Yeah. And when the word bearer unit destroys that enemy unit, the word bearer player gets to pick one of his units, and that unit gets a massive buff. It increases their ability in close combat, it increases their movement, it increases their strength, which affects close combat, for the rest of the game. And then at the end of the turn that they destroyed that unit, they, they pick another unit. Yeah. Oh, so you've done this multiple times. Well, you can only give that buff to a unit three times. Okay. So by the end of round three, you can have one unit that has plus three to their weapon skill, plus three to their strength, plus three to their movement. And that's significant, that seems... especially on like a Galverback unit, that is the demon unit we were talking about, that is, it's really, really good. It's like the it's blessing really of powerful. chaos being granted to you. Right, yeah. and, and you, it, the tactical way to do that, of course, is I'm going to pick your rhino. I'm going to pick something that's easy to kill yep. in one shot, and oh, look, somebody gets a bonus for the rest of the game. And now next turn, oh, is that another rhino? I'm going to pick that rhino. Now, the only downside of that right of war is if none of your units are able to actually strip a hole point or a wound off of the unit that's been pick and picked as the sacrifice, then that unit takes a Perils of the War track. So even the downside is, and that's it, that's the only that's downside. Not too bad. So it's, it's really not that big of a negative to be able to give your army permanent, or units in your army permanent boosts. And one of two ways, you pick one unit, just keep stacking on it, or you spread it out for multiple out. units, right? Um, let's see here. Oh, the other downside to that right of war is it must be traitor. Spoiler alert, both their right of wars, traitor only. Funny how that works. Funny how that works, right? I, I don't see much reason that anybody would ever take a loyalist. But you can. But you can. You but can do a loyalist word bearers, but uh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, their second right of war, Last of the Serrated Sun, and Galver back those units I was talking about, those demon units, um, they can be taken as true choices, not compulsory true choices, but true choices. So now you can have a whole bunch of Galver back. Um, and then any squad, this one I found really interesting. I actually learned this when I was researching this. Any squad, well, and Galverback get the ability to take a specific type of drop pod. Drop pods are a transport that, generally speaking, can only be used, uh, with exceptions, uh, if you take a generic right of war called drop pod assault. And then your whole army hits, uh, enters the battlefield and these tin cans that blow doors off and your army piles out. Well, Galverback can take a, basically a super drop pod uh, called a dread claw, and then any squad that can normally take a rhino can take a drop pod. Oh, cool. Right. So now you can actually have an army that's deep striking, not restricted to the right of war drop pod assault, and you can have a whole I bunch of units. You learned something new today. Right, exactly. Really uh, this one, the downside of it, again, must be traitor only, and this detachment cannot have any allies. It can't be used as an ally, and it cannot be, it cannot take allies. No ally with defense. Got so, it. yeah, that's, that's, that's the word bearers. Again, beautiful army, uh, you know, deep reds, silver trim, lots of uh, iconography, ribbons, uh, ruins carved into things. Aren't they're, really fun to model. What a lot of ways you can go with it. A that. lot of fun to model. Yeah, I was, I was actually looking at word bearers at one point, uh, and the first thing I did is had a buddy of mine 3D print me a ton of little ribbons that I was just going to Plaster yeah, everything yeah. with like or these customize your deep units. And yeah, exactly. Go and have fun. yeah, exactly. I can't wait until we get into some of the other legions because taking a, a, a demon army is one of the armies you can take as as another force other than uh, legions and allying demons to a word bearer's army is like you know perfect. it's like piece of carrots. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It just it's it's perfect. But yeah, it's you guys have both played against. We have a local word bearer player who's a pretty strong player. Yep. How do you guys yeah. like uh, playing to get that word bearer for us? 
Uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> it, was, it was hard to kill anything. Though. Yeah, it's very hard to kill anything. They have a lot of built-in rules to them that make them pretty strong. So super, yeah, Super Salt, yeah. Galvor yeah. Backer. They're good. Really? Why do you think I want to ally them? No, no kidding. And Karn and Arnold Taller Besties. It makes sense. They're best. They're I, just, I, just, I just can't have allies with my right of war. Well, cool. That's the last Trader Legion. So I think we can wrap it up. I think there's one more, actually. I, can't, I, think I, I didn't hear anything. Did you hear anything? Oh, okay. That's it, right? Well, the last. There's another one? There's the a, least. Not the least. The least? That's my last name. <laughs> <laughs> last, least, last, last. So, 20th Legion. Alpha Legion. Finally. <laughs> my favorite Legion. The entire reason I play this game. The entire reason I'm sitting here today. Uh, not that we're friends. It's because no, the Alpha not that I've known you guys right, forever. Yeah. Once, <laughs> you read, uh, once you read that fluff, you were sold. Yeah. I, I haven't played, I mean, real quick, I've known Bob for 24 years, yeah, something like that. I've never played a tabletop game. I was like, oh, 30k, he's like, you should play this. I'm like, I don't know, Bob, there's just no lore. He's like, you should read Alpha Legion. Well, you started reading. Well, actually, you even said you were starting reading, and you came to me and said, I want to play something that's kind of yeah. sneaky, yes. kind of subterfuge, and I'm like, finish the first four books, read Legion. <laughs> Which I did, and I finished the first four books, and I read Legion in a week. Sold. And now I, I own a lot of models <laughs> for a game I never thought I'd be. You're like more blue. You're, you're like a, you're like a a, yeah. a, a, a a kid on Christmas Alpha morning Legion. when you finish that book. You're like, oh my god, it's the Alpha Legion. <laughs> okay, so Alpha Legion. Everything you're about to hear is a lie. Yep, it's all made up. Uh, the Alpha Legion is the twentieth Legion. Uh, they're also known as the Ghost Legion, so it's argued that, so Alpha means one, but it also means primary, um, a many, among many other things. It was referred to as a Ghost Legion because a Legion existed that nobody really understood or knew about. They just heard they stories there, yeah. of yep. these unmarked Legionnaires coming in and doing things like subterfuge, assassinations, sabotage. Um, there were stories of black-clad Terminators with no uh, markings that referred to themselves as the Unbroken Chain. And they were all operating during like the Unification Wars, as early as the Unification Wars, and then in the, the background of the Great Crusade as they spread out, as all of the legions are spreading out and everything, there's the rumors of this Ghost Legion. Um, and even before they turned to chaos, supposedly, <clears throat> Alpha Legion was uh, renowned as the most secretive of all the legions. And you'll read a lot of lore that Dark Angels are incredibly secretive, the Night Lords are secretive, things like that. Alpha Legion takes it to a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. uh, there's We talk about all these characters and everything like that. The Alpha Legion Primarch is Alpharius, sometimes referred to as Alpharius Omegon, and every single Legionnaire in the in the Legion refer, says that they are Alpharius. I am Alpharius. I am Alpharius. Yep. Um, <clears throat> the Alpha Legion is, uh, their veterans are experts in infiltration, covert operations, manipulating events in their favor uh, without revealing themselves. Uh, at, and engaging in open warfare. They thought that was, they had failed when they had to engage in open warfare. The and CIA. Of, the CIA, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, and essentially that, that uh, one of their favorite, their, what they've coined the harrowing uh, form of warfare is where they completely and utterly destroy every aspect of society slowly and quietly before they take military action so essentially they're not equipped the society is not equipped to defend itself crumbles almost instantly and they don't really have to kill anybody so you're talking like infrastructure government and communications absolutely not even like killing people yeah not yeah. even killing yeah. people absolutely all of that stuff uh it's a basically a multifaceted surgical strike the on CIA every part of society. right yeah. um let's see their armies i i, I I wrote some stuff down because I'll go off on tangents if I don't stick to it. Who would do that? Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I wouldn't. Um, 
Alpha Legionnaires also have been known to disguise themselves as Loyalist Space Marines uh, during the heresy. Their armies contain uh, regular humans that they also often refer to as operatives. Um, they are one of the few Space Marine Legions, maybe the only one, that valued humans as equals when it came to their abilities to conduct warfare. They relied on human assets, and they had secret uh, markings and code words and things. The Legion was created in total secrecy, secrecy excuse me, by, on the Emperor's order. Um, and the information on the Legion's own gene seed was made top secret. So they don't really even know how to make themselves. Records redacted. Records all redacted, all things like that. Something that we haven't brought up that I thought I would mention with Alpha Legion is there are three legions, known as the Trefoil, that are supposedly created for a specific purpose. One of which, we kind of can assume the Space Wolves were created as the Executioners. Lehman Russ was the Emperor's Executioner. Release the Emperor's house. dog. Release the house. Dog. Yep. Uh, the other two being Salamanders, which we don't know what they're Purposes. Purpose was. So the Vulcan being perpetual. The Vulcan being perpetual. Some things stuff like there, that. Yeah. And Alpha Legion. We don't really know what their special purpose was. They are the CIA. And everything I'm telling you is a lie. So, hmm. it's... Well, at the end of the Legion, I think you find out what their special purpose is. At the end of the Legion, yeah, the, the yes, book you Legion, do right? figure yeah. out. Um, but I will not go into that, because that is just... You should read... The first four books, and then read Legion if you are interested. I'm betrayer in that Legion. Legion. <laughs> um, they also made a, a policy that they never left witnesses. So if anybody did see them, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, it's going to be a really short summary. Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alpha Legion. I'm going to go. CIA. With, I'm going to go. I'm just going to end there. There's a lot I could go into about Alpha Legion, and it's just one of those legions that you should discover on your own and. And make your own assumptions. And make your own assumptions about it. Uh, so I'm just going to go straight into their Legion ability, which Super they cool. have two. Super cool. Um, only Legion with two Legion abilities. First is called Lies and Obfuscation. Go figure. Uh, essentially, all the models is this that are Alpha is this Legion. A lie? No, this is not a lie. We're past the lies. I'm telling you how the game works. I don't know what to believe anymore. Like, <laughs> but are you lying right now? This shit up yeah. as a joke? Oh, yeah. All models that are Alpha Legion are considered to be two inches further away oh, God. from heard. any enemy unit that is measuring for resolving shooting, charging, or reactions. I gotta charge you. I need to roll seven inches to get there. No, it's nine inches. I have to roll. Steven and I play all the time. Do you know how many times I go, are you sure? No, no. I always say, two inches further away. <laughs> and then I cuss. And then yes. Because I forget. Uh, and that, is, that is a really strong ability. Uh, as Alpha Legion, if you are going to pick up Alpha Legion, you want to be well aware that if you're barely in range, your opponent is not in range. Right. Um, if you get, you're good at using that tactic. You, yeah. <laughs> ability number two it's called a reward of treachery. Remember how I said they like to impersonate other space marines? So there's a rule that allows you to select one non-unique unit from any other space marine legion, and they become Alpha Legion. And retain the ability. And retain all of their abilities, so minus unique, the legion ability. Unique is a named character that's Horus or Abaddon or Karn or Angron, right? It'll say unique in the little... Right. Uh, I.e., you could take, for instance, Fulman Terrace Terminators from the from the uh, Ultramarines, which are incredible, <laughs> and uh, you're just like, oh, these are my uh, these everything, are my alpha everything we've ones. mentioned. Galvorback, yeah, fire you take drinks, Galvorback, this is you like, take my rampagers. Alpha is like, yes, please, and they yes, get please. and they get all the abilities that when, unit has. When we were talking about Thousand Suns and like giving you a war a disclaimer, like it's pretty complex, you. You might want to be aware of it going in. Alpha Legion is, I would argue, the most complex army because you can play everything and anything. Especially in some rights of war you have, too. Yeah. Which, 
Thank you for that. Yeah. Right, Segway. Segway. Perfect segue. Yeah, Kirby segue. <laughs> so I just said you can take any one unit from any space marine army, right? Mm -hmm. So they have a right of war called Coils of the Hydra. Coils of the Hydra is all about misdirection. So you can choose up to three of the same units. Why not? And they're all the same. You have to take you the same You have to unit. take the same so unit. So if you were to take Fulmentaris Terminators, you, you have to take, take three, three units of Fulmentaris. Yeah, because I want to face What if he has to, Bob, for your tournament coming up? <laughs> <laughs> um, he has to pick another unit. <laughs> so you have to take three, uh, up to three of the same unit. Go change your rule save. That means you, Steven. That means they, <laughs> yeah. they gain Fearless the first turn they're on the table because they have to start on the table. And then you have to put an equal amount of Alpha Legion normal units into reserve. That's the downside. And uh, the ones that come in, you get plus one um, to hit when you're shooting phase when they come in from, from the yeah. reserve. And narratively speaking, it's just so cool. It's like, here's Ultramarines, Terminators. Oh, we're facing it's Ultramarines. Alpha Legion. Right. Yes, exactly. it's, the, it's the misdirection. Um, so that's the, the negative, is that you have to put an equal amount into reserve. I thought it was all. Just equal amount? An equal amount. Oh, interesting. Headhunter Leviathan, which is their second right of war, is... You know the theory about kill the head and the body will die? Yeah. That's, that's this one. Uh, they have a special unit called Headhunters. Headhunters Infiltrate. And they have Precision Shot. And they have Bane Strike Bolters, which are better bolters than normal normal bolters. And they just want to go in and snipe out all your special characters. Precision Shot allows you the ability to target a character that's inside yes. of a Yes, so right. inside of a squad, you can target a specific unit, a specific model, and assign wounds to it. Yeah. So you can kill the sergeants, you can so kill the CIA, special characters. The special weapon. Right. Um, they can be taken as troop choices and fast attack choices. Normally, they're just fast attack. And on when they start the, the first turn that they're on the table, they gain the shrouded ability. So they infiltrate, and then shrouded is basically a cover save for them being in the shadows. The, right, yeah. the slay the warlord. Well, that when you're scoring points, you get points for slaying your enemy's warlord. It's worth more points when you take this right of war. And the downside is that all vehicles begin in reserve. And your you have to take more fast attack options than your heavy support options. It's like it's like your forward force. That's right. Kind of, so the infantry yeah. are sneaking gotcha. forward, and the tanks okay. are coming in to support. Sure. Correct. And sense. you they're they're further behind, so they're not really uh, Makes sense. able to catch up. That's the Alpha Legion in a nutshell. I didn't get into as much as I could. <laughs> Deep dives are coming. Dives I love. Coming. I, I'm like. I'm looking forward to the deep dive of Alpha Legion, like he's looking forward to the World Eaters, and he's looking forward to the Salamanders. Oh like, yes, it's an Imperial Fist. Alpha Legion is probably the most complex again yeah. Legion to build because you are overwhelmed with options and combinations. Sure, it's a good thing. It's it's like some of the some of the. Ar uh, armies we've talked about, leads we've talked about, this is kind of the way an army would look, like you've built it this way. Alpha Legion is anything. Whatever you want. Any way you want to build it. And, I will say this, because it took me us multiple times of reading the rules to figure this out. Nowhere does it say traitor on any of the characters. Right. Or any of the rights of war. All of the loyalist legions, their primarchs, are loyalist only. So if you wanted to run a traitor legion, that a traitor version of a loyalist legion, Can't all of the traitor ones, all the primarchs say traitor only. So if you want to do a loyalist version, like you're going to do Emperor's Children, as a loyalist version, you cannot have full ground. No. As Alpha Legion, you can run right. your primarch as either loyalist or traitor. Right. Because who knows? Because who knows? Because everything I said is just a lie. And I'll end on that. Including all the rules. So <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, guys. Okay, guys, gals, girls in, in between. If you like our content, you want to see more, please, again, like, comment, subscribe. And really with those comments, you know, now that we're kind of through the legions themselves, you know, what are you guys playing? Um, or what are you thinking about playing after watching these videos? Tell us where we're wrong. Yeah. Please do. We want to hear these type of things. Again, our next episode coming up, we're going to cover the non-legion armies. Uh, look out for that. 
If you want to support us and help in our ability to create better content, keep moving forward, keep doing this, check out our Patreon below. Uh, thank you for watching. We're glad to do it. Hopefully you're getting some stuff from us. We appreciate you guys. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks guys. Appreciate it.